I'm Mr. Eliasson. Welcome to World History. Today we're going to be continuing our story by talking about how the Italian Renaissance developed and introducing us to some of the painters and techniques and different artistic styles that emerged throughout the course of the Italian Renaissance. So let's dive in. Here are our basic objectives for today. So, as we talked about last time, the Renaissance focused on the revival of ancient texts from Greek and, Ro Greek and Roman sources and was originally centered in the city of Florence, which was controlled by the Medici family. Unfortunately for the, Fl for the Florentines, uh, Italy was invaded by the Holy Roman Empire Charles V, or one of the Charleses anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't particularly matter for this. Uh, as his army marched through Italy, he disrupted political and social structures throughout the Italian peninsula, but for Florence itself, their government more or less collapsed. In the aftermath of the emperors marching away, a relatively radical priest named Savonrola took over the city and decided that all of this Renaissance stuff, all of these new learnings and uh, ideas were secular heresy. And so they held a massive bonfire destroying a bunch of Renaissance texts, and they persecuted all of these Renaissance thinkers, leading to the collapse of the Renaissance in Florence. But for, fortunately for the rest of Italy, all of these ideas and people then spread out to a bunch of the other Italian city-states, and the Renaissance and the spirit of the Renaissance continued. So now that, now that Florence was no longer the, sole, the single home of the Renaissance, we started to see all of these other cities take their place as important, uh, important centers of learning and art and Renaissance culture. One of the first important Renaissance artists was a guy named Giotto. His big deal was that he was going to change the way that we perceived art. So before this, art was generally designed to glorify God, was often in cathedrals because, you know, the church is the one, the one entity that can afford to actually pay artists to do all this stuff. But Giotto had a different idea. He decided that art should try to evoke emotion from people. And so he was one of the first Renaissance painters to try to paint scenes, showing people having large, you know, important emotional reactions with the goal both to portray emotion and also to have the viewers have an emotional experience by interacting with this art. And so by bringing in emotion, he's going to change the way that artists think about what they're trying to even do with the art that they're creating. Brunelleschi is another important Renaissance figure. He was important. Uh, he was very important as an architect. He uh, he created. He was the guy who created the du the Duomo in uh, in Florence. Here, uh, Brunelleschi's dome was famously designed after the structure of an egg in order to uh, sort of use the shape of an egg, which are very strong, which is a very strong sort of natural shape, in order to support this massive dome. And it's noteworthy because this is the largest dome that was produced in Europe since going all the way back to the, the Hagia Sophia back in the Byzantine, the Eastern Roman Empire. So it had been almost a thousand years since Europeans had designed a dome of this complexity. And so Brunelleschi kicks off this whole architectural revolution. And so we're going to start seeing European buildings become larger, more grand. You're going to see these huge domed cathedrals as opposed to the pointed cathedrals and churches that we see pre prior to this era. And so it's just a step forward in general in European architecture. We're also going to see the growth of new artistic styles. Sculptors are going to study the human body to try to create more realistic images. They're also going to try to portray and draw emotion out of viewers. We're going to see uh, new stuff like vanishing lines, which we'll talk about in a minute, create depth within art. And all of this study of human subjects is going to lead us to embrace realism and humanism, both trying to portray the greatness of humanity, but also trying to very realistically portray their subjects. And so art is going to take a light years step forward here and start looking much more modern and much more recognizable to us as sort of modern viewers of art. Botticelli is, in, is noteworthy because he's one of the first people to use these vanishing lines. You can see that in this painting, it almost looks as if the art has depth because all of these lines, all of the lines of the structure and the tables, all converge in a central point in the middle of the picture. This is called perspective. And again, it makes the image, although it's on a flat surface, appear much more real and lifelike. 
Raphael also perfected this mode in his famous School of Athens, which is a picture that looks like a, a, a mural on the wall that almost looks as if you could wander into it. You can clearly see the vanishing lines here, clearly see the depth, and see how, and of course, see the realism, and to some extent, the emotional reactions that you can see on all of the people. They're interacting together, and you can pick out individual individuals, and you can, to some degree, pull out their emotional state. Leonardo da Vinci was the quintessential Renaissance man. You probably know him from painting the Mona Lisa, which, you know, very impressive. But he was also an inventor, creating cool stuff like a flying machine and apparently a, uh, a bow and arrow that is also a shield and creating some, proto some of the pro earliest prototypes for tanks. He also had, uh, he also did scientific uh, study and exploration studying the human body, studying medicine, and studying a whole bunch of different fields. And so he represents the ideals of the Renaissance because of the broadness of his studies and the things he was interested in. He's also famous, of course, for painting The Last Supper, which we see portrayed here, this fresco mural on the wall. And it's noteworthy both because of the, the, you see the depth, you see the perspective, you see the clear emotional reactions of everyone. This is supposedly the moment where Jesus uh, told his disciples at the Last Supper that he, one of them was going to betray him. And so you can see clearly that they all are reacting and having an emotional response to that, which should also allow the viewer to have an emotional response. Michelangelo was another famous Renaissance uh, sculptor and painter. He, the Pieta, which is in uh, which is in uh, which is in Rome in the Vatican City, is the famous statue of Mary holding Jesus' lifeless body after he was taken down off the cross. You can clearly see both humanism, realism, and the attempt to pull an emotional reaction from people because uh, because of the way that Mary is portrayed. And Michelangelo also famously painted the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel with a variety of images from the Bible. You can see down there the creation of Adam at the center and at the very top of the Sistine Chapel, which is one of the most famous examples of Renaissance art. Literature also took a huge step forward in a variety of different ways. The humanists, of course, tried to portray, tried to take this idea of human interaction and uh, take it to its logical conclusion. A, th a Christian thinker named Thomas More wrote a book called Utopia which described a perfect human civilization, further pushing forward this idea that if humans work together and continue to evolve and, uh, and grow, that we could eventually create perfection on Earth. Dante wrote uh, The Divine Comedy, which is the story of his adventures traveling through both hell in, uh, hell in Dante's Inferno, but also purgatory and heaven. And so he describes all of the different things that he sees doing that. And both of these writers are noteworthy because, as opposed to publishing their works in Latin, they had started publishing their works in Italian, in English, in other, in other languages that the common people could read more readily. And so we're going to talk more about this, of course, when we get to the printing press and the broad expansion of literacy throughout Europe. But for now, the fact that writers are publishing not just for a clerical audience in Latin, but for a broad popular audience is going to change the types of works that are being published. Here's an excerpt from Dante's Paradiso in which he uh, describes what it was like to look into heaven. So pause and take that in. And Niccolo Machiavelli wrote a famous treatise on government known as The Prince. He was famous because he was famous for his philosophy of real politik, which is the idea that morality should not necessarily enter into governance and we should take a more cold sort of calculating approach to ruling. And so The Prince is sort of a guidebook to rulers. And the most famous section of it is, is it here is here. Take a moment and pause and make sure you understand Machiavelli's main argument that it is better to be feared than loved. So that's how art, culture, and literature developed throughout the Italian Renaissance. Hopefully you can answer these, these objective questions. Next time, we're going to dive into how the Renaissance spread across northern Europe and how this led to a political, economic, and social revolution for a whole bunch of other countries. So hopefully you got these main points out of this. Thank you for listening.